Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us again today for this series. My name is Clara Bocchino, and I'm the coordinator for the Big Data Analytics and Transboundary Water Collaboration for Southern Africa, which is the umbrella um, entity under which we have this uh, series of webinars supported by the Sustainable Water Partnership and the IUCN Global Water Program. Today, we welcome Tariro Saluchera from the IUCN Eastern Southern African office based in Pretoria, South Africa, who's going to talk to us about water governance in Southern Africa. Before I introduce Tariro to you and I give him the word, I would just like to remind you to please keep your microphone on mute during the presentation. Tariro will have some breaks during the presentation to ask for comments, for clarifications, or just to share your experiences. But if you have something that you really want to pin down and not forget about, you can use the comment box uh, or the question box to share them with us and then we'll pick them up whilst we do um, the break or at the end of the session. So use the chat or use the question tool. And also, whilst we are having a discussion with all of you during the breaks or at the end, you're welcome to make an intervention on a specific topic by raising the question, by raising your hand, sorry, in the, in the panel and then I will give you um, the possibility to make your intervention as soon as the um, current um, speaker or participant is, uh, is finished with his uh, discussion. So without much further ado, let me introduce to you Tariro. Tariro is based, like I said, at the IUCN Pretoria office. He has a wealth of experience with several institutions uh, working for water and water governance at the International Water Management Institute, at the Food and Agriculture Organization, and also with the World Bank. He has a master degree in integrated water resource management, but he's also currently reading for a doctorate in water governance. So without much further ado, let me introduce you to Tariro. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Good morning um, and good afternoon. And I suppose it's also a good evening since we are all in different time zones. So it's um it's great, you know, to catch up with you again on this. And we have been talking in this series since I think this is what third or fourth week now. So, so I hope you can hear me legibly. I'm speaking with you from Pretoria. And let me just quickly go to my screen here. Tariro, can you see the invitation to share your screen? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, um, I'm just... Uh, Let me know if you can hear me because there are two connections. You can hear me right now, right? We can hear you, but we don't see your screen. Okay. You can see my screen? Not yet. Let me try okay. again. Okay, send the invitation again. Yes, I'm going to try now. Okay. Can you see the invitation now? Yes. Just please go on display settings and pop the hand because we can see only the presenter mode for now. Thank you. Is it showing in the correct mode? No, please go on display settings on the top bar in the middle. Yeah, and swap presenter view and slideshow. Okay, um, for some reason that link is not allowing me to do that. Wait. Maybe end the slideshow. 
and then go on the bottom bar. Oh, that, that's perfect, perfect. So this one is working. Thank you. Okay, great. Now you are set. Uh, colleagues, um, we are we are greeting you from a very sunny Pretoria, and things are looking up. We are very positive. We just end of winter, and it's also looking like this is the end of the well, maybe not the very end, but at least the the coronavirus pandemic is spreading us a lot. We came from a period where we had close to 13,000 new cases a day to less than 1,000 a day this week. So we are very upbeat and so am I. And since we've been learning a lot about water governance, beginning with the first uh, webinar that was given by my colleague Alejandro, today I'm here just to give you a regional overview of water governance uh, in, uh, in Southern Africa. So I understand that I have a lot of colleagues from the region in this webinar. Welcome. This is a region that is, you know, full of experts in water and water governance. So let's make this very interactive. And looking forward to a very, you know, a warm and collaborative chat. So let me uh, begin here by just giving you a context. I'm sure some of you may have heard whether it's a distance or the term, you know, look at distance. Historians refer to African countries in general. This is um, a result of, you know, the the events that led to the boundaries that you know that have in Africa states today. You know, Africa was divided you know, over a conference in Berlin um, uh, that is in Germany around 1884-85. So. You know, the, the, the parties to that conference were sitting over a map, allocating each other a piece of the continent. This then became known as the scramble for Africa. I'm bringing this up because it's important in the way we end up with the kind of water governance structures that we do in the region. Because this scramble for Africa happened without due consideration to a lot of things, including, you know, uh, the natural and topographical features that you find now being divided over two or more states. So Africa is not really made up of nation states like you do find, for example, in Europe, where you know that, uh, for example, the French and French, the Spanish and Spain. In, in, in Africa, the vendor in South Africa and in Mozambique and in Zimbabwe, and the Chewa in Zambia and in Malawi and in Tanzania and so forth. So it's a very interesting um, scenario that actually affected several things, including, you know, the, the, the kind of education that was bequeathed to the independent states when democracy took over, you know, when these member you know, states of Africa became independent. So you do get countries that inherited a lot of, you know, differences in, uh, in, in, in education, legal frameworks, and even basic metrics. For example, in Southern Africa, you find Zimbabwe and Zambia, British colonies, Mozambique and Angola are Portuguese colonies. And Zimbabwe and Mozambique are next to each, uh, to each other. They have a very long history of cordial relations. Uh, yet, when, when they need to cooperate on anything, a lot of harmonization is needed, right, from the translations in languages to other things. So by, by doing this, they are, they are, they are there are two things that I want to come out of this context. The first one is that it's this, this scramble for Africa created a very, you know, um, a lot of transboundary situations, uh, transboundary river basins, because boundaries were drawn as and when they became convenient uh, to the colonial parties. So you do have, a, uh, you know, a country, you know, in Southern Africa, in fact, for the lost, for the whole of Africa, you are not going to find any country that does not have, you know, at least a transboundary basin, some with as much as eight. And in Southern Africa, you're looking at between three and five basins 
on average for each for each country. So this also, you know, uh, uh, this conference, besides creating this transboundary situation, it may also have created, you know, unwittingly, of course, or rather it may have actually laid grounds for water cooperation that we now find today. But I'll get to that point later. I just want to give you a trajectory of the water governance in the region to begin with, before I actually come to the water governance on the transboundary scale that we find in the region. So I just divided this in three. I just first want to discuss the indigenous traditional uh, before I come to the colonial one and the present state, which I think the post-colonial or demand-driven era that is really best. IWRM approach, the integrated water resources management approach that is really taken root in the region. So by the indigenous traditional era, I am talking about the period before colonial powers set foot in Africa. You know, I, I always like to start beginning. Much of the history that is shared or the academic research that happens in the region mostly looks at governance from the time recorded history of and because of this something is lost a lot in terms of what was happening how did you actually look at water in the region before someone wrote about it so i'm i'm in this i'm speaking to you uh you know we, from an informed position informed by two things one, this kind of research that is available, and two, having grown up in the, uh, in the region and being party to the communal systems that actually persist, so, uh, most of them up to date. Water is mostly regarded as a, com a, a common pool resource. Together with you know, your, your, your indigenous forests and land in the communal villages that you find in most of rural Africa. And access to these resources is informed by customary rules. And there are a lot of religious values that govern, you know, these are the, the traditional values and access. That is that that now carry some some traditional legal authority that is exercised mostly by the village head, heads or what we call uh, the headmen. The water is actually viewed as a living entity, and you find this in most Bantu societies all the way from Tanzania coming all the way down here to South Africa, where there are, there are, there are certain sacred rights that are quoted to water and there are things you cannot do, for example, in a river course. And then the activities that are actually governed by certain periods uh, you know, you know, of, the, of the calendar. I'll give you just a few examples. Um, if you go to rural Zimbabwe, if you go to rural Zambia, you do find that, for example, there's a specific time if you own, you know, a head of uh, uh, cows, at what time do you water the cows? Do you drive them to the river to drink? And how does this relate to other uses? Like people who actually farm com uh, small gardens for nutrition and food security along the river systems. These are all also the rivers where laundry happens. Uh, uh, people also take baths here. So, in as much as there's no actual written rule somewhere, you'd be very surprised to see how these water uses function so seamlessly at the community level. And to an, um, an informed eye, you'd think that there's some kind of control, you know, someone is standing somewhere behind a curtain with a book giving people orders, but not at all. These are informed by, by, by customary law. And there's a lot of, you know, incentives and you know carrots and sticks that come with the disobedience so the ownership of water and how it is used never really rested in uh, with anyone you, you didn't build a dam and say that own this uh, this amount of water so you will find you know as we go through this discussion that some of these values have actually found their way to present day um, demand driven approaches and that might also be a reason why some of the provisions of IWM were very easily taken up here because they were consistent with what was already happening uh, in the region. So when colonialism came then, 
it kind of drastically altered this by bringing in the issue of ownership, titled ownership of water and related resources, including land. So there was, from the 19th century, there is you know, what is normally referred to as the this era came with a lot of civil engineering and industrial development and irrigated commercial agriculture that accompanied colonialism. Focus was on, was on development. So the supply side of water, water tension. The idea was, you know, conquering nature, uh, what others really call creating an irrigated Eden. When you look at the size of commercial agriculture that went in, in, in um, in a, in a lot of the mainland states. So powerful state bureaucracies were created. I remember you'd find, uh, for example, between Zimbabwe and Zambia, the Central Africa Power Corporation was created around 1963, uh, you, you, which was actually mandated with building Kariba dams, shared by both countries and a huge source of hydropower up to date. Kawara Basa was built in Mozambique, which, and it was built by an agreement with, uh, between the Portuguese colonial power, actually, and the South African government. In South Africa, down here, we have the TCTA, uh, which came late into the century, and, uh, you know, uh, that went about creating one of the then miracles of civil engineering, bringing in water from Lesotho into South Africa's commercial heartland of Houting. So here in Pretoria and around Jobek, we actually use water from Lesotho. So this this era brought title to to, uh, to the ownership and created uh, of of water and created a very skewed uh, and inequitable water consumption uh, a paradigm where most of the commercial interests had water and owned um, license to to exploit and use water resources much you know to the disadvantage of a lot of the traditional and communal setups that did not have much say in how this was done. And bearing in mind that we were also dealing with, um, with governments that were not democratic then. So this era saw a long stretch of, you know, consumptive water uses that basically changed the face of the continent and you know, the landscapes you know, cutting up of urban areas, mines, towns, agricultural uh, enterprises and so forth. Then coming into the 1990s, you know, the, the supply-oriented paradigms came in, which were very much influenced by the Dublin principles and the onset of IWM. You listened to Alejandro's, he gave a lot of this background principles and how they affected uh, much of the, or rather how they informed the, the IWM. Other geopolitical factors also came into play because as African states were getting more and more independent, they got a lot of the political backing from, from the East. And when the Soviet Union fell, a lot of the support that was coming to the states from that side switched. And the states, you know, focused now on the, on the West and a lot of donor aid, a lot of uh, capacity development initiatives started actually coming in from uh, from the West. And this coincided now with um, with, with the IWM era because you see later in the discussion how a lot of the international cooperating partners really facilitated the development you know, uh, of IWM in the region by building capacity, you know, providing financial support and so forth. So much of the uh, macroeconomic policies that you found in governments really began to take a, a market-based liberal approach as opposed to this uh, socialist, you know, communist um, uh, basis that they used before that was inclined the, uh, to, the, to the Eastern ideologies. So there was a lot of scaling back of, uh, of government, which means what was spent on social services, what was spent on provision of basis, including water, was really now going into, you know, into the hands of autonomous institutions that were, were being created 
to create some kind of efficiency around government. So you begin to find some new authorities, you know, being in charge uh, of uh, example water. And if I if I can give some examples, you'll find the, the Zimbabwe National Water Authority, you'll find the uh, regional water administrations, the others in, um, in Mozambique. And this happened slightly late in South Africa, where you begin to find the catchment councils and so forth, they're supposed to be autonomous and run independent of central government. So the promotion of structural adjustment brought this up. And, you know, water was really, you know, promoted as an economic good, or rather the approach to managing water was now really based on water as an, uh, an economic good. Uh, you know, shifting focus away from just provision to, it, uh, to people on a, on a on a, on a state largest um, approach, if we may use the word. So the approach that began using economic incentives to, you know, to increase water efficiency. So the IWM reforms at just at the national level, you know, saw a lot of change in policies and legislation. You begin to see, you know, um, new national water policies across the region in Mozambique, in Zambia, in South Africa, in Malawi. And, you know, this was also the time when the ownership of water was then re-clarified, really going back to, you know, what I mentioned earlier is, 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 is what we had in the, you know, indigenous situation, uh, in the indigenous era. I like the South African constitution of this one because it really clarifies this, you know, in a more explicit way. Well, ownership of water now rests with the state, and then a minister actually holds this in trust, and you begin to see the use of water, you know, being licensed according to the commercial use that is being applied for. And of course, some of the natural rights uh, and people's rights, you know, on water being, uh, being protected by what they cost uh, in South Africa, for example, you know, a uh, schedule one water uses. And this, you know, brought a lot of, you know, pl uh, plurality in terms of the people and the stakeholders that are party to, 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 to any water course, because uh, basin planning became a lot more part uh, participatory than before. The idea now, now shifted to, to, to be demand-led. So water institutions got decentralized to the lowest possible users to create platforms for key stakeholder participation. And this is what we now found in catchment councils, uh, sub-catchment councils, or water user associations across the region. So this is where we now find ourselves with um, uh, in terms of, you know, water, water governance at national level. And a lot of partners, you know, the international cooperating partners that are called ICPs, were involved in helping this. There was a lot of money that came into the region from, you know, um, organizations like, like your Swedish uh, Development Agency, SIDA, and uh, AFDB, that is African Development Bank, uh, GIZ, the, that's the Germans, World Bank, the, the Dutch, and so forth. So this helped in terms of capacity building, in terms of now uh, establishing these new institutions. And from the 1990s coming up to now, this is you know, more or less what we have. And at, a, at an international level, I you know, really focused on promoting water cooperation. So we, we really had a very interesting phase where shared river basins now we had to sign some kind of treaties some may refer to them in um, using different languages. So this was to create platforms for, for cooperation and, you know, joint water uses, you know, uh, and uh, some kind of harmonization of national laws in order to meet the IWM approach of a basin-wide management approach. So the regional frameworks through SADAC also got um, established in this era. So the, what, what is, you know, what is interesting is that we, we there's a very interesting interplay 
between SADAC, the regional body, and what um, is obtaining in the river basin organizations of the shared water courses, but I'll come to that shortly. So the promotion of a benefit sharing and joint basin planning is really now what drives water cooperation in the region. And you know, some of the biggest um, water courses or, or, or catchment areas, including Ogavango, the Limpopo, uh, the Zambezi, uh, where the earliest to sign these treaties. And this worked in a very interesting way in that first set signed treaties, then from there, a river basin organization is built. Then at the end, you have a secretariat that coordinates the work that goes on uh, in the river basin. So in a nutshell, this is the kind of background that informs what we have uh, in the region currently. So before I go into the specifics of what we find in Transbor, I just want to pose um, the first questions. What is important to reflect at this point is that WRM as an approach has, has really taken root in the region and we find it being practiced to varying degrees of perfection across uh, the Southern Africa region. And the region itself is a huge beneficiary of, um, you know, a lot of support that came from the international cooperating partners to promote uh, IWRM. And this set the stage for water cooperation in the region. And I pause for any points of clarity or questions now before before I go into the transboundary governance um, slot. Thank you very much, Tariro. That was a very interesting um, historical review of um, how even just the perception of water um, in Southern Africa changed. I, I remember when I was researching for my PhD, I remember thinking that one of the biggest changes brought about by um, the colonizing powers was that waters became from a change from being a gathering point for communities because of course where there is water there is life to become a boundary uh, because it was an easy demarcation on the ground and of course when you're trying to divide a territory that is mostly unknown you look for those natural boundaries like mountains and rivers that can create that sort of easy division and uh, and I also remember thinking I wonder how how different it would have been if instead of being considered as boundaries that would have been still even in the colonial time conceived as points of contact and points of points of interaction um so that that took me back to to to, to, to my studies as well so many years ago um <laughs> it tells you when we talk about natural resources there is really not much of a of a sort of boundaries in that respect either so thank you very much for that and and thank you for having taken us to to where we are now and and the multiple roles that that national governments and international agencies are are playing in supporting an integrated approach for for water governance in the region um i don't see any comments or questions from our participants um but if somebody would like um to contribute to this historical review that Tariro has just given us or to ask any points of, of clarifications, you're very welcome to raise your hands now. Um, if I don't see anything coming up, then I think you're you're good to go ahead for the next um, session. And then I'm sure there will be uh, more interactions once we get into the functionalities of uh, transboundary governance in Southern Africa. I think that seems to be the case. I don't um, I don't see any raised and you raised hands. Okay, thank you, Tariro, the floor is yours. Now, I, I hope that um, the lot of questions is because people understand it very well, not because they are confused by anything. Okay. Um, and something, put your microphone I, close to your mouth because the volume fluctuates and sometimes we cannot, yeah, so I think that would work better. So it doesn't fluctuate, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, now I come to transboundary water governance uh, in Southern Africa. I'll just give you a highlight of the key issues, the role that SADC plays 
and the new enabling framework that is there, and then give a, you know uh, a better nuance of the key partners that have been seeing SADC. Now, just an overview of the key, you know issues that we find ourselves with in the basin. Southern Africa region um, is home to some 15 major basins that cover over 70% of the land, uh, the, and way more than 30 shared aquifers. It's just that the groundwater knowledge is still growing and the mapping is still going on. But um, if there's someone from the groundwater management institute, I'm sure they have you know the more accurate number at present. Most of the states are really, you know, in a water scarce situation, and some are worse than others. But the region, in general, going into 2040, 2050, is one of you know those that have been highlighted to be uh, to be in serious levels of water stress. Anyone familiar with the region, you know that in countries like Namibia and Botswana and South Africa, a huge part of the drylands experience desertification actually. We, we have a region that is really victim to a lot of weather extremes. A lot of drought is experienced at the same time. We also find a lot of, a lot of floods. There is a huge rural population in the region. This is important to realize because in as much as you talk about shared basins, you are still dealing with people who live in the basin that live within a certain community and do not really understand or have this perception that we are living in a transboundary uh, basin and you know the, uh, the other people upstream or downstream. We are looking at people who are not in a very water secure situation that still really have to work hard you know to end their livelihoods. It's a region that has a lot of you know consumptive water uses because of you know, an expansion of a lot of uh, commercial uses, including irrigation. You know, if you look like um, at the Zambezi water course, the planned irrigation among the eight countries that share the water course so far is more than 100,000 hectares. Uh, there's a lot of mining going on, there's a lot of industrial growth and urbanization, which not only, you know, uh, consume a lot of water, but also uh, really pollute the existing water resources and make or rather render some of the the water you know unfit for other purposes after you know they've been used in industries or or, or in mines. So this is just among other issues. Colleagues from the region can testify that we have a lot more issues than this, but I'm just giving you you know just the highlights here. So where does now SADA come in? I think one of them the, if you compare uh, across Africa, one of um, the very important roles that SADC plays is in the governance of natural resources. For colleagues from out of the region, SADC is a um, regional body, you know, a, a political economic body that consists of 60 member states in Southern Africa, to a certain extent, the Southern Africa Development Community. So the, the, the Sadak Secretariat is based in Botswana and Gaborone, and it is a dedicated water division that takes this, uh, the responsibility actually of overseeing the, the shared water courses in the region. So this is important to understand at the regional level, Sadak is an organ that oversees water cooperation. And to do this, several uh, instruments were crafted to enable this oversight to be useful. This will include the protocol on shared water courses, the regional water policy, and uh, planning documents, including the regional water strategy and the regional strategic action plan, which gets updated uh, every five years. So I just want to have um, a brief overview on two of these, that is the, the protocol and the water policy. So the third act of 1992, the shared future, you know, uh, peaceful, economic, uh, uh, peaceful economic in the region set the tone for this because you don't find this cooperation only in water. You also find it in energy, you, know, you find it in agriculture, in environment, 
and so forth. So oh, you, you all have this, uh, this you know, sort of thing is sitting within the setup secretary. So the, the protocol on shared water courses was, you know, first crafted in 1995, then it was revised in 2000, you know, after the UN convention on, on the law of non-navigable issues of the national water courses came into play. So the, uh, the revised version, we had to take some of the provisions into account. Um, what is interesting and rather uh, you know, very important to note is that this protocol is a binding legal agreement. So in all countries that share water courses that have ratified um, this protocol, this is, in a very, uh, this is a very important step that actually enforces them to observe the dictates of this protocol. So the protocol itself established principles of water cooperation, including, but not limited to decision making, dispute resolution, shared information and monitoring. So you find this happening in, uh, in your shared uh, business, also to varying levels of perfection as most of these are still developing. But um, the, 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 pro uh, the protocol gives this you know, legal mandate to the static water division for supervising, you know, uh, the RBOs and, you know, of regularly being in uh, in conduct with key stakeholders in the development and, you know, revision of 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 the resource. We call them the resource, the regional strategic action plan. In fact, we are just at the tail end of the fourth one, and coming into 2021, SADC will have a, a fifth regional strategic action plan. And the regional water policy which came uh, in 2005, is rather uh, a guidance document on the implementation of the protocol. So it has a lot of recommendations when it comes to catchment-based water management, and it really you know, uh, makes a strong recommendation on the establishment of shared water course institutions. So this is what I was mentioning earlier, that in a river like the Mpopo, in a river like the Orange, you sign it, uh, the, the two the, the two or more states that share the river first sign a treaty that gives you know an indication of the willingness to cooperate and from there then a river basin organization is built so you find these recommendations uh, in this water policy and it you know there's there is there is um you know this strong recommendation of a treaty and RBO and the secretariat Although now, because of the different size and economic importance of the business, you don't find a secretary to each and every one of them yet, although there are a lot of plans to make sure that this is uniform across the basin. So we have varying levels of cooperation where other basins have an Arab bureau and a secretariat, others have some kind of committee, like you find in the basins like, uh, like in the Ingomati, like uh, shared by South Africa, Eskwatini, Mozambique, like in Kunene, shared by Namibia and Angola, like in the Ruvuma, shared by, uh, by Tanzania and Mozambique. Uh, there is actually some interest in debate about what form of cooperation is the best. And I think there's a 2011 paper from Jonathan Louds from IMI on this, where there was some kind of revision um, and assessment of the forms of cooperation. And I also wrote a paper, I think you find that in the water policy uh, 2016, where I made a comparison of this, you know, different forms of cooperation within the SADC region. But we don't have time to go into that. Uh, I just want, you know, to give you the, the, the importance of the oversight that was created and how the policy, uh, the policy works. So the, the regional water strategy is actually informed by the, by the water policy and it helps shared water courses in, in uh, <clears throat> to implement cooperation and identify areas that need capacity. So some key partners have been you know very crucial in this journey to start realizing this one of them being the global water partnership which is a leading partner up to now uh, is technical development committee played a big role in uh, Supporting uh, the implementation of IWM among the states, and up to now, uh, you know, SADC 
convinced a lot of events uh, with uh, the Global Water Partnership. We also have WaterNet, which is a regional grouping of key stakeholders, including academic institutions, such as uh, institutions, governments, uh, and other key stakeholders who, you know, are practitioners in the water in the water sector to implement capacity building uh, programs through training, research, and demonstrations. And again, a lot of support that came into WaterNet um, was from 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 uh, from the Dutch, from from Sweden, and so forth. Currently in IUCN, we are also working a lot uh, with SADAC, and we are an, uh, an implementing partner. And our task, among others, you know, is environmental water management, and we also do other things with SADAC, including transplant and conservation. Lately, we have the SADAC Groundwater Management Institute. That is an affiliate, I think, um, the process of completing that uh, that that uh, affiliation, I believe, which is a new kid on the block and they've really hit the ground running. They, you know, groundwater is really becoming a very uh, critical issue in Southern Africa because of the status of water security. So a lot of mining is happening and a lot of shared aquifers that need equitable management as well. And in this is to find that you know, these are implementing partners that I'm talking about, among others, but there's a lot of funding that comes in, supported by, you know, <clears throat> the, the institutions mentioned earlier, including the Germans through GIZ, USAID, the World Bank, um, the GTIs, that's the, the Dutch, AFDB, and uh, many other partners, I can't exist them all here. And most interesting, also DFID, which works a lot with creative the region. Uh, to, to, to build climate resilient infrastructure around you know around our, our our water resources. So at this stage, I just want to put in for questions. I want us to ponder on a few points of reflection. One being, you know, the that we completely have a solid regional uh, institution in terms of what the kind of support and oversight that gives to the region, compared not just to other parts of Africa, but globally, I think we have some um, very competent and solid, you know, institutions that enforce water cooperation. We, I also want us to consider the big role that we find uh, from the support that comes from 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 the ICPs. International cooperating partners and the implementing partners as well. I want us also at this point in time to understand that within SADAC, we still have some way to go in terms of groundwater and uh, and the shared aquifers. I I I wish there was some some space to bring someone from SADAC GMI just to give an overview of this, but they have a lot of this information on their website uh, as well. But I'll pause here for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teriro. There are a couple of raised hands, but I'll have to go with the first question that came in from uh, Tomani. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Tomani, so you can uh, quickly ask your question to Teriro, and then is Remy um, also with a raised hand. So, Tomani first. Um, I'm going to unmute you now. Thank you. You can ask your question. Mani, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, Taro, for, for the informative uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Tomani Manungfala. I'm calling from uh, uh, Cape Town, and uh, I am a researcher at Parliament with the Portfolio Committee on Water and Sanitation. Um, my question relates to RBOs. Um, when I, the, in fact, it's 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 well publicized that, uh, uh, insofar as uh, effect their effectiveness in terms of implementing the um, strategies under the SADC revised protocol, uh, is a bit limited and challenged, partly because of um, issues of capacity. 
uh, as well as uh, perhaps maybe um, uh, resources. So uh, what I would like to know from your side uh, and with your experience that uh, because you are involved in the region and you have got uh, hands on knowledge of these institutions, um, what, what are the challenges and uh, is this assertion true that um, uh, the um, RBOs are not as effective as they're supposed to be? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tumani. Do you want me to respond to this now, Clara? Or, uh, it's, the, it's a very specific question, so go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Tumani is putting me on the spot here. So let me, let me answer this as diplomatically as I can. <laughs> when you look at the decentralization of water institutions, it is through that we have had a lot of challenges in the region. But it is not entirely accurate to say that they are not um, effective. I'm saying this because the experiences vary with countries. If you go to Mozambique, for example, where we work a lot with um, with, uh, with, the, with the regional water administrations, with Arasendro, with Arasu, with Aranote, you realize that you know these catchment councils are doing a lot of uh, work they've been established for some time. And the capacity, though it may not be exactly where we want it to be, has been growing over the years. You find the same thing when you go to, for example, Zimbabwe's uh, catchment councils and sub catchment councils. If you go to Tanzania, it's more or less the same situation, for example, with, um, with Mozambique. So the assertion is not entirely accurate, but it's not false either. It is true that we have a lot of challenges. And for example, I know you may want, you, you may have been talking about this with reference to South Africa. In South Africa, yes, there's, there was a time when we needed to have 19 catchment councils, now reduced to nine, and having a constant division of, you know, the, the, the strategic plan around, around how best do we establish them. So, just to get to a point of what are the challenges? The challenges, in my view, one of them is the historical legacies you've been trying to deal with. For example, in South Africa, when you go to a province like Limpopo, uh, like Mpumalanga, where a lot of the licensed water uses have already been allocated to, to, to a lot of commercial uses, changing that, you find that the government need to consider a lot of things, including the economic impact, including the jobs, including food security and so forth. So it's not something you can change within a year or overnight. So this is one of the things that come in. Uh, in, in regions where most of the you know, licensed water uses still really have a lot of all allocations available, the challenges will be different. But one other thing is that because historically a lot of the water licenses were tied also to land title. So you find that a farmer, for example, we had 1,000 hectares of land, also had just, uh, some, some, some water license. And if you, are go if you are going to do any kind of water allocation reform, it has to actually work in tandem with the land reform. And because land reform happens under a different department, sometimes the processes don't really talk to each other at the pace that we need them to. So you get to a situation where land reform happened and Tomani gets a farm but he still does not exactly have the water to use on the farm because legally speaking, he doesn't have, you know, authoritative access to it. So the, the decentralized institutions are dealing with these kind of challenges. And one last example, uh, for example, in Zimbabwe, where the catchment councils and sub-catchment councils have been built, working very well for some time, then we had a massive nationwide land reform that really tilted the ownership of that land and the people who were making up the catchment councils were replaced you know overnight by different people whose capacity to deal with this was not exactly the same with the people who have been using the water for the past 30 years so now again the government now have to get into deliberate um, and long-winded approach to build this capacity uh, with these new owners of the land and users of water so these are the challenges that we will be going through 
in the region, I think for a little while longer, but in the end, I think we're getting there. It was a long answer, but I hope I answered you somewhere. Thank you, Darira. I think you're right. There is, to my mind, a bit of a, of a bit of a mismatch between what the RBOs are tasked to do and what the reality of water management on the ground is for many of the reasons that Tarira has, has, has pointed out to. And also, you know, a river basin organization by its very nature is a sort of an extension of the different countries that lend their officers to it. So the members that form part of the decision-making body of the river basin organization are only as effective as they are mandated to be by their own government. So if they have a sort of independence in making decisions, in making commitments and things like that, then yes, they can work as a, as a commission. But if there still has to be a back and throw with national government before reaching a decision, then it becomes lengthy and then it becomes probably less slim than one would want it to be. I know that in our midst there is somebody that works for um, River Basin Organization. So if you would like to, I'm not going to name you, but if you would like to make an intervention uh, from an RBO perspective from Southern Africa, you're welcome to yourself. Um, I see that, uh, Tomani, have we answered your question? Would you like to have a follow up? And then uh, I think I'm going to give the hand to Nelly because it might be an intervention that relates to this point. Tomani, have we answered your question? I think it's muted. Yeah, no, he's not muted, but for some reason the microphone doesn't reach. Uh, while we wait for him, Nelly, I'm going to mute you. Um, do you, Nelly Bozibore, do you have an intervention to make on this point of the RBOs? Sorry, yeah, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, yeah, so sorry, no, I don't have any suggestions or interventions, but it's an additional question to the river basin organizations. Um, okay. I'm Nelly Bosibori and I'm speaking from Nairobi, Kenya. We are having similar challenges regarding, well, we used to call them catchment advisory committees and we are just in the process of, you know, giving the, the, the uh, these river basin organizations more authority and autonomy autonomous for them to be able to make individual uh, decisions and you know in terms of just in improving their governance but from a financing perspective I'm curious to know what you know success stories there are or what financing approaches have been used in the Southern Africa region to ensure that these river basin organization at least are able to uh, raise funds to self-sustain their activities because it's one of the major challenges that we're having here in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. Do you want to answer? I will respond to, uh, to this in part. Firstly, because in terms of actual success stories, we don't exactly have many to crow about yet. This is an evolving issue and the uh, you know, the, the water use associations or the catchment councils are kind of faring differently. I can pick a few examples like Ingo Mart in South Africa, where um, a lot of the water users are licensed through the catchment council. So the catchment council collects levies, one, and there's also this drive in Ingo Martin and other places to, to, to really implement the economic water uses in terms of payment for ecosystem services. So you're not just looking at water users who should be paying something to the catchment councils, but also other, you know, key stakeholders in the basin who make use of water-related activities. It doesn't matter if this is consumptive water uses or, or non-consumptive. Um, at this point, I think most of the of these bodies that we work with still receive some kind of grant from government what you call voted funds, because in terms of autonomy, they are not at the point where at a national level uh, or at a, you know, even at a, at a transborder level, they are able to stand on their own. It helps where there's infrastructure that, you know, water users can actually pay for. For example, in the Ingo Mati, you, you have, you know, two big dams, a lot of sugar farming, 
So when you look at this and you look at how, how much the, the, the sugar farms pay in terms of levies, in terms of license fees, it goes a long way in keeping the catchment council afloat. And this becomes very different in a situation where the entire catchment council is made of subsistence users and a few commercial interests here and there. I hope there's someone on the call who is from such a catchment council where they have some tips on how, you know, how the financial part can really be, be, uh, can be implemented. Thank you, Torino. Thank you very much. I think, yeah, that's as much as we can give in terms of the, the answer because we don't know exactly the ins and outs of funding of that. And I do not see the representatives of the RBO, but if anybody else knows more about funding the RBOs and, and sort of looking at financial sustainability, please do make an intervention. In the meantime, I see we have um, a question from John Ginny, but Remy uh, from Geneva, he had a question and uh, a hand raised earlier on. So, Remy, I'm going to mute you. You're welcome to ask your question. Thanks, Clara. Uh, Tarira, can you hear me? Very yes, well. I can. Terrific. Um, thank you so much for your presentation thus far. Really informative, and um, I'm really enjoying it. My name is Remy Kinner. I work for the uh, Secretariat of the Convention of the Protection of Use of International um, Transboundary Rivers and International Lakes, based in Geneva. Switzerland and um, my question is really to just get your feeling from the global dimension supporting the regional uh, and national and local dimensions of, of water governance. The, as, you, as you said in your slide earlier, the SADC revised protocol was revised in order to um, bring it up to date and in, in line with the 1997 Water Courses Convention. Uh, the 1997 Water Courses Convention is one of now two global water conventions operating at the global scale in line with the, the convention uh, that I work for, the Secretariat. Um, and I just wanted to, to get a feel from you, given that the, the 97 Water Courses Convention essentially, or the SADC revised protocol mirrors the 1997 Water Courses Convention, and both global conventions are now being uh, promoted by the UN Secretary General as being uh, codifying international water law principles um, and, uh, and, a, and a global platform for transboundary water governance. What do you see as the reason for some of the limited uptake and accession to both conventions within the SADC region? And also, how do you think, how do you see that the, the global conventions could better support uh, RBOs and uh, treaties within the region? Because I think SADC is a great exemplar region for a region that is, uh, you know, prolif proliferating with its um, transboundary water agreements and also basin organisations. And, um, and yeah, I would like some insights into how, at least from the global perspective, um, there could be added value. Okay. Um, thanks, Remy. I, I actually just want to give you a very quick and direct response to one of the questions on how to make you know, or, 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 or why maybe there's slow uptake. I think because the conventions mostly, you know, are guiding documents and they facilitate a lot of this cooperation. What we find is that the how to part now is a little context specific. And one good example is on water allocations in this region. We, we, we have a lot of discussions around in business like the Okavango in basins like Pungu and Sai, where you you we, you want to talk about water allocation, then you realize that okay you can, yes there's no way you can really allocate water the physical resource equally or equitably so some you have to go beyond that and think of the benefits and then how do you make the benefit sharing equitable? So in terms of the availability of tools to actually do those things. I think that's where a lot of the capacity is not really where we need it to be. I'm hoping there's someone from the Secretary Secretariat on this call who will come in later. And uh, another typical example, in IUCN, we've been working in the Pungwe Sawibus Basins. I just, I'm gonna present that case study shortly, uh, very briefly. 
were again in water allocation. The two countries were very happy to incorporate some of these provisions in this, uh, from these conventions. But then they said, look, we, we actually want to make the water allocation in the, uh, in the, in, in the river sharing agreement very useful. But we don't really understand how to do the ecological flow assessments effectively and sustainably. What do we need? And then we actually had to go into a training phase and say, look, this is the kind of support we can give you, which we are still giving. Uh, it's really going uh, a long way in helping, but in my assessment, we actually going to, are going to need more than that. So these are some of the challenges that come in. So it's not that you find that the member states either don't exactly understand the conventions of the proposed. I find that in most cases, they really do. And they really understand, uh, you know, uh, want to comply with them because they understand both the logic and the science around it. But the actual tools on how to go about doing it is what really causes this, you know, the, the slow uptake. I hope someone from SADAC is here to actually add to this response. Thank you very much, Tariro. Remy, I hope <clears throat> that at least partially answered your question. Yes, thanks. Thanks, uh, Tarira. I mean, I can continue the, the conversation further offline, but thank you for those insights. Uh, very, very useful. Thank you. Tarira, would you like... if Sorry? I'm, I'm saying to Remy, it's very good if you can reach out and, you know, uh, work. I don't know where you're working in the region at the moment, but to actually, because that's one area that I think is also very important in the region in building this capacity to make sure that you know, these, these, these conventions and the provisions are dead to, is something that is really needed in the region, is something that we are also very ready to support if we, I mean, if and when we get, you know, other partners to come in. Thank you, Tariro. That's, I think you might be yeah, thank you. I think you may continue with the presentation for now, because we have half an hour left uh, of, like, blocked time for all the participants in the session, and then we can pick up this and maybe other points like that from John, uh, in the next break. Thank you. Okay. Um, because of time, I'm just going to briefly run through one typical set of transboundary basin. Um, I chose this one because these are three relatively smaller basins that are adjacent and are shared by two countries, Bob or Mozambique. So this is Pungwe, Sale, and Uzi basins. So they are most normally collectively referred to as Pubuza. So these are basins that um, very interesting in the sense that you're looking at, tri uh, at a tribe basin that covers uh, rather a, an institution that covers the water basins signed by, by Zimbabwe and Mozambique under the Joint Water Commission. And then they went on to sign individual basin cities. And it's this, this you, you, you find a lot of natural hazards in these basins. Uh, droughts, floods. This is also where we had the word infamous cyclone die not a very long back. Um, it's also uh, an area of growing commercial water uses, including mining and agriculture. A lot of pollution goes on, especially from agriculture. And as we speak, there's some sudden intrusion from the sea along the Pungwe water course. I think it's coming up 80 kilometers already uh, into the mainland. There's also a massive groundwater exploitation, especially down uh, in the South Basin. And right now, there's a lot of work going on on institutional strengthening and building a tribe Basin authority. And this is really being helped by the, you know, by the regional framework that said that is So there's a, it's in, the Joint Water Commission was signed in 2002 as an agreement that Zimbabwe and Mozambique need to, to equitably share these water courses. And one very interesting thing about, uh, about this, there's a very encouraging amount of cooperation going on, even before and during, you know, the, the, the establishment of the formal platforms for cooperation. In, um, in 2016, and only in 2016, was there a city between the two countries on the Pungwe Basin. And last year, a city came up, which was also ratified on the Uzi Basin. Currently, the Sawe Basin 
treaty is, is, is being negotiated, it's almost finalized. And then there, there are also discussions around the tribe based institutions and the hosting agreements uh, that are, are, are going you know, on now. And IUCN and other partners involved in um, this process. So the institutions are very much uh, informed by the set of water policy and this strategic action plan. And you know, in tandem with SADC, um, there's a base in the road map already, which aims to achieve, you know, all this uh, the cooperative institutions and stakeholder participation. And there's a lot of support that is coming in, and you always like a lot of support coming in in SADC. Some came in. In fact, a lot of it came for, uh, through through the Pungo phase one and two that was uh, supported by the Swedish. Uh, seed institution, and a lot of uh, funds were also, you know, given support by the FDB and defeat through through Credit. Right now, as the IUCN, we are working under our bridge program, Bridge Center for Building River Dialogue and Governance. And yeah, well, I think this talks to the shirt that I'm wearing. This I hope we can all see it. Uh, in 2018. Uh, you know, the GIs that in DFID, uh, we're also working through SADAC to support the little stakeholder participation uh, work that is going on uh, there, that is now taken over. I think I'd rather say that is receiving further support now from the resilient water program that is supported by USAID through Chemonics International. So we, we, we within this particular basin, one of the interesting things is that the two basin management agencies that we find in both sides of the border was uh, Arasendra on Mozambique inside and Zilma Savi catchment in Zimbabwe. They've been working together so well. And you know, despite all these challenges, and despite not having an RBO yet or secretariat yet, a lot of work has been achieved already. And this, you know, there's a lot of you know platforms uh, for cooperation that exist. And you actually find that the technocrats who are involved in this cooperation are people who are on a first name basis and share a lot of information, even not always through the formal channels. I just wanted to give out that um, that case study to emphasize the point that you know, while, while in SADAC we have a very good and enabling framework, cooperation itself has never been much big of a challenge. I think because of a lot of historical ties around the region. Also, you know, where I, you know, I said earlier, the unwitting support that the Scrum of Africa created, because we have, you, you, you keep finding people with shared cultures across states. So building trust is not a very difficult thing among states. There is a project called Daphne, I think is coming to an end now, which is done in the Zambes Basin. And they produced papers on how the idea of building trust becomes important in transboundary cooperation. And they find that in the eight states that share this amazing, one of the things that are very important there is trust is very much shared among the, 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 the middle and lower basin, and to some extent also the upper part of the basin. So much so that all the help that has been coming in through the conventions, through the international support, has been very easy to, to put to use. I just want to quickly talk about, you know, the opportunities ahead and the kind of challenges that we have in the region, given that we, uh, you know, we we have this, um, can I say, functional cooperative environment. So I'll just give a current status and future outlook uh, because of time. Uh, all all the bases uh, are covered as a kind of agreement or treaty. In some cases, like Ruvuma, you may not find an actual treaty in place yet, but there's an MOU that is allowing the two countries to, to negotiate. And we are working in there with SADC and IUC uh, the bridge program to support. We have a lot of established stakeholder pl uh, platforms, including SADC wide ones, like the SADC uh, water dialogue that happens every two years, the SADC Arab Bureau framework, the which actually holds a workshop also every second year in the Zambezi. You also have the annual um, uh, Zambezi Basin uh, uh, Forum. And 
in terms of capacity building, a lot of work was done through Waternet. And uh, Waternet actually sponsored a lot of postgraduate studies, which sponsored um, some government officials. This has been going on uh, over 15 years. I think it's 20 years now. So it's very encouraging because this training code is actually offered at regional level. So you will find academics and government people that are given scholarship coming in to be part of one class and go through the two-year master's program together. And after that, when it you know becomes time to have some kind of discussions, you find that, for example, we are dealing with the Orange River, the South African delegation and the, the city delegation, two, three people who have been classmates before. So this has really been able, I mean, has facilitated a lot of efficiency and trust in terms of the cooperation that we're talking about. And although the groundwater issues is still coming up now, uh, great strides have been made by the institution like I alluded to before, and some capacity building courses are going on. And I said that GMI is also, you know, uh, involved in putting this, putting out this uh, groundwater repository for the whole region, which will encompass all groundwater data in a harmonized fashion. In the end, I believe that's one of um, one of the aims. And you know, from from this background, I want to say we still have some challenges, urbanization, uh, population growth that is going to need a lot lot of resources. Uh, the climate induced weather and extremes, including flood. Uh, and one of the things that came up from the discussion you're having, like you saw, a lot of dependence on ACPs. It's great that this has been coming in for the past 20 to 25 years and it's well needed. But going forward, uh, some demonstration of internal capacity and political commitment to head water courses, uh, water course governance will be very critical in the success of water cooperation. The, there's, there's a vastly different, I mean, capacity level in terms of uh, the effectiveness of human financial and technology, uh, technological resources to address water. So you have 16 or so member states. What you find in one country is not exactly what you're going to find in, a, in the other country. It's something that the region is trying to address. We are not there yet, but the progress is encouraging. And sooner or later, I'm sure uh, we'll get there. I'm sure we'll get there before we hit the you know, water scarcity, critical water scarcity levels that have been predicted actually to come uh, into the region by, by 2050. Uh, that said, I just wanted to alert colleagues on this platform that we, we, we it's not all you know, doom. It's, it's, we have plenty of, uh, of opportunities. You know, there's some transfrontier conservation going on in uh, you know, heavily promoted, which is looking at um, you know the the shared conservation across states, and plays very well with the shared water basins in terms of proximity, in terms of the governing structures and so forth. And you find that you find that most of the landscapes where this is happening is also where you have the shared water courses, like like in, in the Limpopo, you have the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park in. Um, Zambezi, we have the Kavango, Kavango, uh, called Kaza. And we are, in each case, you have three, four countries there that already have some negotiating and cooperation, you know, uh, background on the water side. So this kind of strengthens this and refocuses energy along transfrontier conservation, which will then include water. And the climate in just emergencies are really bringing the kind of political attention that the sector really needs. And because we have these institutions at the regional you know, level that are maturing, that are actually crafted in accordance with international conventions, we are in a space where we have some great opportunity to work with partners globally to strengthen water cooperation um, in the region. And we have a very networked region, which I said before, where you, you, you have people that really know each other. I can hardly walk into any SADC water platform 
doesn't matter which country it, uh, it, it is in, and not know at least 80% of the people in the room. It doesn't matter these people are coming from governments uh, or, or coming from uh, the ICPs or from other NGOs. Anyone who has been working in the region for, for, for more than five years realizes this sector very well. And because we are coordinated at such a level, these discussions keep going on and this is the one of the saving graces that we, we, we have in the future. So, how are, I mean, how are we helping uh, in IUC? We have a water program that is working in the region and which really focuses on strategic areas, water governance in the investment, natural water infrastructure, water for development, you will remember that the IUC recently launched each is uh, nature-based solutions, local standards, something that you're also trying to bring into the water sector in the region. I won't explain this because we're short of time, but I'll be very happy to follow up on what we are doing and where. Um, but we are very much poised to respond to a lot of priority issues uh, in the region, including uh, you know, the climate risks, the gender, and the indigenous populations. We we are working in um, in the Pungwa Sawipus Basin. We're working in Lake Malawi at the moment. We have worked in um, in, in, in the Orange River Basin and in the Okavango Basin. And we will keep working in other basins. We have projects that are coming in. And we hope that our presence in the region actually goes, you know, a lot further. Working with other partners, of course, to keep this cooperation um, going on. And this is the bridge program, which is one of the, the projects through which we work in our producing work program. And bridge aims you know, at increasing capacity to implement national transboundary water balance. So Remy was asking about you know, these conventions not taking shape and so forth. This is one area where we have a good um, and for collaborations to, to, to keep working in the region. And, you know, we are supporting, for example, the uh, tri-basin institution building uh, in Pubosa and the, the improved watershed management that has been happening around, especially in Tanzania and in Mozambique. I don't want to put too much time on this. You will find most of our work in the water program in about bridge on the IUCN website. So in a nutshell, I just want to say, um, SADAC, I, in my opinion, we, we uh, water cooperation is encouraging. It's going on, it's not perfect yet, but I think we are taking the correct steps to be where we should be. And uh, we require you know, some more capacity to make sure that we reach the perfection that we do especially on tools that we have to use in executing uh, benefit sharing, in executing water diplomacy. We do have some of the tools under our bridge banner in IUCN and a, uh, in our you know, nature-based solution standards and welcome partners want to work with us on this. And I think, you know, in terms of opportunities, we really are poised to do more work. So the kind of interventions that are required within SADAC um, compared to other parts of Africa and I believe in other parts of the region around water cooperation are really not now on the how-to part because we do have some established platforms for cooperation. We do have some very good um, stakeholder participation processes. We do have national water policies that speak to watershed level management and we do have a level of willingness among the key stakeholders, including a growing commitment within uh, the political government. So this is the end of the discussion. I hope I managed to make some justice to your time, Clara. But yes, at this point, again, I think we can have some more questions. Thank you very much, Sarira. Yes, you've done a lot of justice, both to the, both to the content and to the topic of, of today's discussion. And, and to the time. I think your last couple of slides um, have partially answered a question that came from John Dini. But John, um, I see you wanted some more specific in terms of impact on specific economic sectors. So 
Um, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question directly to Tariro. <coughs> You are, you should be able to um, to speak now, John. See if it works. Yeah. Thanks, Clara. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you. I can hear you, Julius. Great. Thanks, Tariro. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. And the the thing that um, I was curious about a lot of what uh, what I'm reading about you know the kind of success factors around transboundary water management in the in southern africa um, uh, kind of tracks back to the existence of of a regional economic community like sadic and and nesting the transboundary water management function within sadic and um, you know the protocol as a sadic instrument um, you know and one of the benefits that's been put forward around that is it it it, it potentially enables better integration of transboundary water management with transboundary management of other natural resources. Um, so things like agriculture, I mean, you spoke about conservation um, in your case study, uh, trade, tourism, things like that. Um, so other, you know, other sectors that are also um, either have an impact on water or are uh, dependent on water. And I just, I just wondered if we're seeing any evidence of that in the in the region, you know, in the in the operations of SADC, whether we're seeing um, a good integration of of transboundary water into transboundary management of other resources. Um, okay, thanks, John. Clara, do you want me to go, or do you have the other questions first? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thanks, John, for this question. Actually, I think of it more as an opportunity at this point in time. Uh, a few weeks back, we were giving another webinar uh, with SADAC where this came up as well. In terms of integration, yeah, to be to be to be frank with you, I think this has not been happening before. It has only started coming onto the table recently. I think because of two reasons. It's because when you look at the other things like agriculture, like um, protected areas and so forth. They fall within different government departments. And even at the SADAC Secretariat, they fall within different units. So these units have been working in the silos for a, for a good amount of time. But recently, this has come up, and in the Limpopo at the moment, where you know the, the Limpopo Water Course Commission it now has more relations with the Great Limpopo Transfrontier uh, Park, and there is there's some ICP is well willing to support this, including the European Union. Uh, and then you see the, a similar situation in and the Casa Transfrontier Park. So at this point, these are still very much discussions about integrating this. And we can't say at this moment there's evidence of it happening, but there's evidence of the discussions having begun to take place and the intentions really getting stronger and stronger to work at this level. And I agree with you, this is something we really need in the basin because if we work uh, on one resource, we are still going to come back to some you know, landscape after working on water, then try to work on agriculture, then try to work um, on, uh, on conservation and species, which becomes very inefficient. But I'm glad the thinking is now there at the regional level. And I can only hope, like I mentioned, in the opportunities that we all work together to get this done. And colleagues um, that are on the call, um, John is speaking, I think, um, he's sitting less than a kilometer or so, I think, from me, and he's from the Water Research Commission. So there's a very good opportunity for us to keep talking about this and for you to join the discussion. Thank you. Very much, Tariro, and thank you, John, for the question. Just to just to confirm what Tariro has said, and also to to add a little bit of a of a of a perspective from a from an other sectoral areas, I think traditionally when we talk about conservation in Southern Africa, we tend to talk primarily about um, wildlife, sometimes forestry. Um, the larger context would be land users and land ownership. 
Uh, but very rarely we, we put together the water. It's a bit like Tarira said, because of the departmental issues, but also because when we form people that are experts in conservation, water is not there. So it doesn't even feature. And it has been sort of coming out organically thanks to that uh, element that Tariro very well highlighted. The fact that this region is very highly interconnected and networked. Um, it is true that more or less we, we know each other in now also across the sectors because we, we have to try and bridge through our sectors to understand better how we can work towards environment, environmental quality, environmental health, sustainable development. So we kind of as individuals have to reach across our own sectoral boundaries and so we try as we can to then bring more people in. So from a transfrontier conservation area uh, at the SADAC level we are trying to engage more with, with water sector um, as well as um, agriculture and the same goes from the water sector trying to understand more about what happens in the in the conservation uh, field. It helps to have uh, international conventions like Ramsar, for instance. Uh, you know, the, the Ramsar is a water convention, but it's also a conservation convention. So it brings together the element of water quality for um, animal and ecosystem health. So it helps to have this kind of contextual element, and it also helps to have um, increasing amount of regional programs from the ICPs of SADEC who are looking at integration and, and really looking at fostering this kind of multi-sectoral angle of environmental management, water management, to, to make sure that um, when we talk about um, a transfrontier conservation area, for instance, we don't forget that there's not much point in focusing on, on, on animal health if there is no water quality, for instance, or no water quantity, because you know that brings the life part of it. So programs like, um, for instance, the Resilient Waters uh, or res the Resilience, the Resilient Program before that have done a lot in terms of helping this kind of um, bridging. And I think we have um, a couple of people representing the program online with us today, um, especially I think the Chief of Party is here, Kule. So Kula, if you have no objection, I'm going to put you on the spot here just to tell us a bit of how <laughs> how we manage to, how we use this kind of highly networked um, system that we have between the practitioners, the, the decision makers and the different sectors and try and bring it to life um, with new and innovative um, cross-sectoral programs. Kula, you are unmuted. The floor is yours. Thank you. I promise you, I have unmuted you. No, Hello, I can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, okay. you Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you and good afternoon, colleagues. Afternoon, Tariro. Thank you for a really great hour and a half. Um, let me uh, firstly correct. I'm, I'm the Partnerships Advisor on the Resilient Waters Program. And, Sorry, uh, <laughs> but uh, but no, it's great. Just I, I have the opportunity to, if I may, uh, add to some of the questions that have been asked. Maybe to start with Tomani, your question, which was about the capacity of um, some of these river basin organisations. Pro our, our program, Resilient Waters program, is working very closely to with the with the, the RBOs, particularly of Limcom and Ocacom to build their capacity both technically in terms of technical products but also in terms of warm body staff that we have uh, resourced the institutions with to enable them to meet their obligations. Um, then coming to Nelly's question about RBO financing, uh, thank you for bringing in the examples from as far off as Kenya. Um, we are working very closely with other partners in the region and to Tariro's point about people the nice thing in this region of southern africa is the the camaraderie that exists between institutions etc and coming to his example around Pupusa, uh, his organization iucn is part of many 
including GWP, that are working together with ourselves as resilient waters to try and provide uh, collective capacity to that Pupusa uh, tri-basin tri institution. And obviously, the support that we provide comes in many forms, but it can, it does substitute as a form of providing financial resources when, which are much required, especially now as the, as the RBO is still getting off its feet. So, um, but these examples exist elsewhere in places like Okavango, Okacom. We've got a lot of RBOs like UNDP, European Union, the CRIDIF program. NGOs, even like the Nature's Conservancy, all providing their bits and pieces of support to help out the the, the functionality of Okacom in that instance. So there is financing that is happening. I think uh, we can, where there probably needs to be more attention. Well, there is attention, but we can, as we appreciate our member states in the regions' uh, budgets, um, we can probably do a little bit more work in terms of influencing the release of financing from the member states themselves to support the work of some of these um, transboundary institutions. But certainly there is no shortage of interest from the member states, neither is there a shortage of interest from other ICPs and NGOs uh, that are working in, in some of these landscapes. And then to John's question about the overlaps between TFCA and RBOs, yes, indeed, there is um, there's a great deal of overlap there, and Clara articulated it very, very well. In the case of the, R, the GLTFCA, uh, for example, as the Resilient Waters Program, we are working to uh, help them to develop a transboundary water management strategy together with other NGOs and partners and the member states that are working in the GLTFCA. The GLTFCA also is a transfrontier conservation area that is smack in the middle of the Limpopo River Basin. So collaboration with LIMCOM is also going to be important. It's the same member states that are working, but just in two kind of thematic, the geographic areas and thematic uh, landscapes. And then also just to mention in terms of our work that we are doing to support the CASA TFCA, the, one of the big things that we're, we're going into now is looking at helping them to do water quality monitoring. Um, you will appreciate that water quality is important not only for ecosystem health but also for the the livelihoods and industries and other kind of uh, uh, uses users of water that exist within these landscapes and in tfc in the casa tfca this is no different so there are a lot of overlaps there and i'm sure if there's need for any further um, information to be shared uh, I'm happy to share uh, my email address uh, through Clara and we can share more information. But just to end on the point that uh, uh, Tariro has made extremely well uh, is that of the strength of partnerships. And uh, just to commend also IUCN, your own organization, Tariro, who's involved with uh, so many different types of work in these transboundary landscapes and working with a lot of partners. I know IUCN has got a Biopharma program, which is also working in these transfrontier conservation areas with ourselves and others. So um, just to say that partnership approach is, is very healthy in delivering our uh, objectives to improve livelihoods and, and uh, ecosystem health in this region. Thank you, Clara. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kula, for actually having put some more meat in terms of how the interconnectivity happens and how we are really trying to get more of it going, both in terms of programmatic, um, but also decision-making um, inputs. There is um, one comment and sort of contribution to the discussion from uh, uh, Iphigenia, uh, who's talking about the European Network Natura 2000. Iphigenia, we are past the time for our workshop, but if people are staying on as usual, we're happy to continue for a couple of minutes longer, but can you briefly share with us the example of Natura 2000 and how does it compare to what you've heard so far from Southern Africa? I'll unmute you now. Thank you, Figenia. Just very briefly give us an idea of how does it compare, because you talk about it as a common sector connecting conservation and water. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Okay, 
Uh, I'm Iphigenia. I'm from uh, Democritus University of Thrace and um, acknowledging the, uh, the valuable conversation and the valuable comment about uh, how uh, we can link uh, uh, the conservation issues with uh, water issues, uh, I would like to make this comment because the European network uh, Natura uh, 2000 uh, deals with uh, the conservation, the protection of protected areas in terms of their habitats, uh, in terms of their species, uh, something like that you mentioned about Ramsar areas, uh, including also a lot of uh, water, uh, of aquatic ecosystems, let's say, or water-related ecosystems. So I think that uh, uh, it could be a, a very, a very uh, good and useful idea uh, for a next discussion on how, uh, on how we could uh, uh, consider these two issues to, to find out, to figure out the common uh, sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iphigenia. Yes, the Natura 2000 network is, is quite interesting and it is a, it is a European program, so in many ways it's a bit like um, a, SADC, a SADC wide sort of program dedicated to conservation, which we, we kind of don't have in that respect because we focus on the, on the PFCA sort of components in terms of conservation, although there is a, a larger directorate that looks into uh, food, agriculture and natural resources, and then we have a separate directorate for, for water. But I think if you could share um, with me, and then I'll, I'll put it as handouts to the group, um, some basic information on how the Natura 2000 network works, I think it would be a good lesson learned for us. What do you think, Terido? Of course, of course, Thank with you. pleasure. Thank you. Ferrero? No, I'm saying yes, that's perfect. If you can share that, then we can always then link up after this. It's okay. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question directed to Kule from uh, Hugo from Awards, uh, but I think you can tackle this uh, directly with him. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to you on an email after this meeting, if that's okay. Let me. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. It's it's very specific on on uh, on the resilient waters program. So uh, if there are no more uh, questions or comments on the presentation and on the discussion, I would like to thank Tariro very very much for this very clearly very interesting and and very um, innovative presentation on where we were in the region, where we are, and possibly where we're trying to go with the help of all the parties concerned, from the governments to the key stakeholders to the, to the ICPs. So this was very important, and we're going to pick up on a lot of elements of this discussion in the last session in two weeks' time, when we're going to have a roundtable discussion. So if you're interested specifically in the Southern African scene, um, the last event in two weeks' time will be a roundtable discussions on uh, how to um, boost the transboundary governance of, uh, of water uh, resources in Southern Africa and how innovations like big data can help in this process and how do we move forward from there based on the work of the um, collaboration that we have um, been working on for now two, close to two years. Uh, which is the transboundary um, big data analytics and transboundary water governance for Southern Africa. So I would like to thank all of you for uh, your time today, for staying longer than usual uh, or than expected. And we look forward to seeing you again next week when James Dalton, who is the director of the IUCN Global Water Programs, will talk to us about a variety of case studies of transboundary water governance um, from different regions in the world that have specific issues of governance, conflict resolution of or environmental management that needed to be resolved and how these were um, the processes were at least initiated to resolve such issues. So 
If you um, are keen to listen to that, please log in next week again at the same time on, on Wednesdays as usual um, to listen to John's presentation. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you. Sariro, if you want to say your goodbyes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.